think that I want to go back to the, uh, b- before we dive into actually your study, I have a couple questions about rehabilitation centers and, and sober living places. Do you think that they um, uh, give you the food that you might want to try and help you get off the substance they're focused on? So they, they'll they say, okay, yeah, you can eat those Doritos. Mm-hmm. They'll make you feel good. But no, you can't have, just stay off that other thing that you were using to make you feel good. Does it stay off the cocaine? Here's a Red Bull, though. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh, 100%. It makes their job easier, <laughs> for one. <laughs> There is a real message within the substance abuse recovery, and I'm not speaking for every treatment center out there. There are obviously, there are the exceptions to this rule, but the main narrative is that your problem is your substance. And so by any means necessary, stay away from it. Have the Red Bull, have the Eggo waffles, have, you know, the, the sugary cereal, have the sugary treats. We know that refined sugar reduces the the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal and opiate withdrawal we know this and so it's fine do that but there's a flaw in that <laughs> that addiction is the substance is a huge flaw okay because and again i don't i don't like to speak in 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 broad terms i'm not saying this is for everybody there are individuals out there who uh for whatever reason medication is a lifelong thing and please, you know, continue to, I'm not a doctor. I'm not telling anybody to not use medication or not seek traditional treatment, but the traditional recovery model asks us to believe that our problem is our substance, that there are chemical hooks in the substance that create a dependency that is so difficult to get rid of that no matter what you, you have to identify your problem as being the substance and abstain from it. And here's the problem with that. The substance is a solution. Anybody who has been in substance abuse, recovery has a very profound experience of understanding that the minute their substance are taken away from them, all of their problems still exist. And what I now, what I believe to be the core of addiction, and there's a British journalist named Johan Hari who wrote a beautiful book called Lost Connections. So the core of addiction, this is what he says, the core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life has become too painful a place to be. And the source of that pain is a disconnection from meaningful bonds in life that give us the experience of showing up and, and feeling alive. So let me take, for example, both of you. Both of you have, from what I know, have done amazing amounts of inner work on, on yourselves. You have developed and created and cultivated a life that is very meaningful. You have a bond with yourself physically and, and, and emotionally that you want to show up and be present for. You have bonds and connections with family members and friends that you want to show up and be present for. You have a purpose beyond yourself that you want to show up and be present for and a connection to the natural world around you that you want to show up and be present for. Now, if one evening you were to go and for whatever reason, somewhere, someone was to offer you heroin or someone was to give you heroin and you did it and you, had, you, you got high on heroin and you had an amazing experience, it was pleasurable, uh, you, you, you didn't, you know, nothing went wrong. And then the next day they came to you and they said, hey, Do you want to continue to use heroin because of how meaningfully connected you are to these bonds in life that you want to show up and be present for the statistical likelihood of you saying yes is very low. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was to take somebody who is severed from those meaningful bonds in life, somebody who doesn't have a loving bond with themselves, someone who doesn't have relationships that they feel like they can show up and be present for, they don't have a purpose that gets them up in the, uh, in the morning that they want to show up and be present for. They don't have a meaningful connection to the natural world. They don't have a, a future that makes sense to them in any meaningful way. Their financial future doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And I was to give them heroin. For the first time ever, they would experience relief from that dis- the pain of that disconnection unlike they've ever felt in their life. And if only, it, even though it was only for a, you know, a brief several hours of the day, the relief from that pain is so compelling that if I was to offer it to them again, they have a very high statistical likelihood of saying yes. Not because the substance is chemically dependent, builds chemical dependency, but because of the relief it offers to a pain that they just cannot understand. They don't know how they got there. And when you're in it, it's very difficult to see the way out of it. And when you're offered a solution that works like that, it's very easy to say, I need it again. And we need to look at addiction recovery from a more comprehensive model from looking at it at that standpoint about how do we treat the human and how do we create an environment that strengthens their ability to reconnect to the possibility. I mean, you know, early addiction recovery is defined by six months. So the potential for full connection within that six months is very low. 
but how do we strengthen the potential for them to see the opportunity to reconnect to those meaningful bonds in life? And we're doing a real disservice by saying, all you have to do is stay away from the substance, go to a meeting where you identify yourself as an addict and stay away from those substances and, you know, uh, go to therapy, which I love. Therapy is amazing. I think everybody should be doing therapy. But again, we have to talk about how do we live with ourselves? How do we live with other people? Right? And how do we live with the planet? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I want to just hop in because you just uh, gave me an, an aha moment. Uh, mm-hmm. My own story, my shtick was anorexia. My acting out on my inner pain was anorexia. But it had a uh, sidecar uh, best friend as cocaine. And yeah. my journey in recovery mostly had to do with um, learning to eat again. Uh, and I've always said when people say, well, what about the cocaine? Because that's always a question because I was a you know, it was an every night thing. Um, and, and sometimes it, all, the, all the way during the day. And I just used to say, I don't know, it just it just I don't know what happened. It just kind of fell away. I guess I don't have a really addictive personality, which I, I kind yeah. of do. So I never totally believed that, but I didn't really know. But I'm realizing now, as you're saying this, that when I was using, I was lost. I was scared. I was in a puddle of self-loathing. And as I began to seek meaning and get better and start to be able to have rich, fulfilling relationships and and do things in my life that I thought uh, were meaningful and still do, um, it did, it literally just did kind of fall away. But I'm now learning that uh, it wasn't just like by some stroke of luck or something that it, it fell away. Uh, for, for most of us, your experience is what is the experience, right? That we come to an understanding that your pain made sense, mm-hmm. right? That, mm-hmm. it, that the anxiety, the sadness, the frustration, the anger that we feel when we're disconnected makes sense. That it's not this aberration, this outlier, this indication of being broken. That we as humans are feeling creatures. This is what we do. We feel and we feel very deeply. And the flaw in our society is giving us this story, this narrative that one half of the breath of human emotion is an indication of failure. Yeah. And the other half is an indication of success. And then you have to live within one half of the breadth of human emotion and insult either by medication or avoid and, and restrict mm-hmm. as much of the other half. And when, for whatever life throws at us, we end up spending more time in one half, the, you know, the, I, would, I would say the, the, uh, the, the anger, the frustration, the anxiety, that's that breadth of human emotion. We try to escape it instead of allow it. We try to see it as a, as a diagnosis, as a pathology, rather than a reasonable response to life. And when we come to the understanding that it makes sense, that it is meaningful and valid, then we can lean into it. We can allow it to to exist and we can develop a new relationship where we're not trying to confront it and fight it and suffer because they're not going anywhere, but rather view them as a constant companion for us that guides us towards our truest self and to no longer to need to escape through substance or escape through behavior, but be willingly feeling as humans. You know, I, I completely agree with this more holistic view of dealing with addiction, and I think it's it's so spot on. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.